Weideman. Welcome to The Realignment. Thanks for having me. So Reeves, you just authored Billion Dollar Loser, The Epic Rise and Spectacular Fall of Adam Newman and WeWork. But you also did some really great reporting about WeWork sort of pre-IPO space at New York Magazine. So for the sake of anyone who didn't follow the sort of WeWork kerfuffle, which is to put it lightly, can you sum up the company, who Adam Newman was slash is, and sort of the course of events that sort of led to this space right now? Sure. So, you know, WeWork was a company founded by Adam Newman and his his partner, uh, Miguel McKelvey, uh, in 2010. This was sort of in the um, kind of uh, end of the, the last recession, the, the financial crisis. And, and they started this um, uh, basically what we now would, would think of as a co-working company, but it was essentially a, a business of um, taking up uh, commercial real estate and uh, cutting it up and adding in uh, beer kegs and nice coffee and good design and and renting it out to people, and and for years um, the business grew uh, pretty pretty in a pretty extraordinary way. It, it doubled in revenue every year, um, expanded for for basically a decade, uh, expanded all over the world, um, and and by the time I started writing about the company. Uh, in in the beginning of 2019, it had a 47 billion dollar valuation, and and the reason we were interested in New York, uh, interested in the company at New York Magazine was that our office in Soho, in Manhattan, was suddenly surrounded by half a dozen WeWorks, um, and and so it felt to us like let's just try to understand kind of how this company is seemingly growing as fast as it is, and 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 where it's going, and. It very quickly became clear to us that that the core to this story, both both in the rise and some of the problems that were already starting to emerge then in, in the spring of 2019, were were centered around Adam Newman, the the founder of the company, and and it was only from the time we published that story in in June of 2019, um, it was only uh, I guess three or four months. Uh, between then and and the company uh, attempting to go public um, and and having that effort uh, flame out in in pretty spectacular fashion last fall and and resulting with with Adam being being pushed out of out of uh, out of the company. So, so the most obvious sort of question here is aside from the various. Adam anecdotes, which I think there's a million of those, but the books are told. It's it's an it's a narrative book, so I suggest everyone who purchases it just read through that part. And we could obviously get into it here, but I think the first question would be, why does this story sort of matter? Because obviously there's there's plenty of founders, and Adam was sort of the 10x version of this, but there are plenty of founders who have sort of idiosyncratic personalities. There are plenty of companies that spend a lot of money and don't make a profit and either flame out. Why do why for you does this story matter? I think we saw it as kind of the most extreme version of a, of a lot of what you just talked about and, and a lot of the ways that the startup world seemed to, to operate in, in the 2010s. This was an era of, of you know, pretty incredible economic growth and, and pretty incredible opportunities for startups where, where money was, was easy to raise. Um, the impulse for, for many of these companies was to just kind of grow as big and as fast as you possibly could. And, and we work in some ways was kind of the apotheosis of that. They, it was uh, a company that, that spent money more profligate, profligately than, than pretty much anyone else um, eventually losing $2 billion the year before its IPO. And, and so I think we wanted to kind of understand sort of how that ecosystem had developed um, and, and in, in both in, in the WeWork story and in, in the way that it would kind of, it, that, that it worked uh, with all these other companies that were rising at the same time. Yeah. So let's talk about sort of the funding model, because sure. when you're thinking about this idea, which is that we work in many of these sort of um, venture back companies don't actually make a lot of money. I think if you're sort of a person who's outside of the tech or venture capital space, it doesn't really make any sense. You don't really consider that Uber doesn't actually make a profit. Um, if you look at a company like Peloton, it just started making a profit because of sort of the pandemic, but these are places that are sort of funded that way. So can you speak to that ecosystem and sort of the logic behind that idea? Yeah, well, well, part of the idea that drives the venture capital world is is you're trying to hit home runs constantly. And so if you invest in in 10 companies and uh, nine of them burn up all the cash you invest and, and kind of flame out, but one of them becomes this this giant um, globe-spanning company, then then that's a win uh, for, for 
you. And, and so there is this impulse to sort of push these companies to, to try to become these, these really large organizations rather than trying to just kind of, you know, be a small, nicely profitable um, company. So I think in, in some ways, just sort of the venture capital model um, and, and the, the incentives that are there is, is one way that, that companies like WeWork are in some ways already interested in trying to grow as quickly as they can, but, but they become, that, that becomes the driving impulse because the people who are, are funding, uh, funding them only, only really are interested in, in trying to create these, these giant companies. And that's the key thing because um, my co-host Sagar, who couldn't make it today, he's reading the book as well. His immediate question was, why can't WeWork just be a big company, right? Like three, a $3 billion WeWork, which it is now, to right. your sort of normal person, that seems like that seems huge. But to your point here, yeah. if you're a venture capital fund, like for, you know, that actually isn't a great return. That actually isn't, or at least given that the valuations people were investing in, that wouldn't actually be a successful exit there. So that's the sort of important thing to note. Yeah. And, and there was this key moment in the WeWork story, which is, which is the entry of SoftBank. And, and that happened in, in 2017. And, and leading up to that point, WeWork had raised a, a large amount of money, oh, more than a billion dollars. But it was running out of places to go for cash, and and there was actually an impulse at the t at that moment to kind of say, you know, we might need to go public now. Maybe we're only a fifteen billion dollar company. That might even be a little bit of a of a stretch. But um, let's let's try to see if we can kind of flip the switch at at that point, as all these companies say they're going to do. Flip the switch from we're growing to we're going to figure out how to sort of normalize our operations. Um, and then what happened is is SoftBank came in and said, uh, "Here's four billion dollars. We want you to keep growing as as fast as as you can." And and that moment was was uh, again one that that has continued to repeat um, from from SoftBank specifically and 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 the Vision Fund, which we can talk about um, in 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 various industries of of these companies that just kind of are, are are getting supercharged. And and even if there might be some impulse within the company to to kind of find a a, a nice even way to operate. Um, it's hard to turn down $4 billion and, and go and pursue the growth that someone's pushing you towards. Yeah. So before we get into SoftBank, I think the question here would be what's driving the lack of profitability of these sort of companies, right? Because when I'm saying companies, I'm not just referring obviously to WeWork. You're also thinking of the Ubers, the Lyfts, the Pelotons. Why is it that these companies aren't? So when they're choosing to pursue growth, what are they sacrificing from a profitability perspective? There's a version of WeWork's business that could be profitable, and and in fact, in its very early days, it it was. And and the issue is that um, it, to operate WeWork's business in a profitable way, you have to do so pretty slowly. Um, you you you're. In fact, unlike a lot of startups, WeWork was bringing in a lot of revenue um, early on because every month their their members, their tenants were were paying them. Um, paying them rent. And, and so, you know, when th th there's a version of this where, where that could have continued and, and the company could have grown kind of slowly, uh, but somewhat methodically and, and instead kind of what, what was sort of that, that, that is basically what, what was sacrificed. And, and instead you, you take this money uh, that you're given from investors and you basically subsidize the service. You, you subsidize, um, you know, we work was offering, um, a year, even two years of free rent to people in order to get them in the building and in, in, on this idea that in the long term, they're going to love the product and, and they want to stay. And that's, that's the same thing that's kind of happened with, with Uber, with all, all of the food delivery companies is, is, you know, none of us are, are currently paying what, what these services actually cost. And, and so it's, it's all in an effort to basically try to make yourself so, um, just so ingrained in the industry that whatever industry you're in, whether it's taxi service or commercial real estate, that that eventually people will will pay what what it what it costs. So that that of course is is the question that remains to be seen for for all of these companies. And and I I don't totally know if there there are many that have have really figured it out yet. Yeah. So can we talk a bit about Amazon? especially sort of towards its inception and for its sort of middle bit, because if you sort of, it's easy for us to sit here and 
especially for listeners, to sort of look sarcastically at this sort of model. But in many ways, if you're a 2010 startup, you're looking at what Amazon did, which is for the first, you know, what, six, seven, eight, 10 years, Amazon was not a profitable company. It was a sort of a money pit. You know, you could sort of go back and look at the some 2001 Motley Fool article about how it's never going to make a profit. And now Amazon's huge. So I feel like if you're any sort of tech founder or venture capitalist, to your point about home runs, you're searching for the next Amazon. If you have to lose some money to get there, that seems to make sense. Yeah, I guess the question is, are you building an Amazon-like company or not? You know, uh, part of the problem for something like WeWork was that they it didn't really get cheaper for the company the bigger it got and, and the different ways that it expanded because it, it's a real estate company. It had to continue sort of adding um, real estate, which was expensive. Uh, Amazon had plenty of expenses, obviously, but, but it, it, it sort of was in this kind of more methodical way um, expanding sort of what it was offering in a, in a way where when you move from selling selling books to selling everything else, it it kind of makes sense. But and 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 you can see how eventually you're going to achieve these kind of economies of scale that, that sort of help you out. With with WeWork, every new space more or less cost as much as the last one that you added, and and they were able to kind of trim those costs a little bit. But in doing something that was so so physically intensive, um, it, it they just couldn't quite shave them off. Uh, in, in, in the way that Amazon was able to through its business model. So I think that's one thing, but you know, the, the flip side of that is of course, yeah, everyone wants that and, and everyone doubts these things before, before they happen. So that's one of the reasons that, that founders keep shooting for, for that kind of goal to attain. And this is the key thing though, which is that you said we work was a real estate company. Yeah. Amazon is a tech company. The thing is though, and this then leads into SoftBank, we work Adam Newman, et cetera, argue that they were a tech company. You're sort of arguing that this isn't the traditional real estate business. It's only worth $3 billion. It's a tech company. So can you sort of, before we sort of get into what was quote unquote techie about we work, what, what is your definition of a tech company? Um, cause this also le- this also leads into the vice conversation with its inflated valuation, but what, what is a tech company? That's a good question. I don't know if I've ever thought about it until this moment, so b- bear with me. But um, you know, I, I guess it would seem to be something where we're building and, and managing software is at the heart of, of what you do. And I, I think with something like WeWork, that just wasn't the case. The, the heart of what WeWork did was, was building and operating physical spaces. And, and what the company sort of was trying to do was, was to use technology and to develop technology that made that easier. But for one thing, it never quite did that. It was never quite able to create, you know, any of the various things that that it hopes to, including, you know, some version of kind of a, an internal LinkedIn. Um, and and so I th- I think it you have to look at what um, what is actually core to what your business does. And I, I think you with WeWork it, it it became pretty clear that that you know this was a real estate company. I think it's a more interesting kind of dilemma to look at something like, like an Uber or a Lyft. Um, You know, the core of those businesses is people providing, um, driving a car for for someone. Um, You know, those companies have, have sort of been very pointed in, in claiming we don't own the car. We don't operate the car. Um, That's of course a a big debate going on um, right now. So I, you know, I I think those are sort of more, more edge cases um, in, in at least thinking about what a tech company is. Definitely. And could you sort of speak to the attempts that we work made to sort of define itself as a tech company, aside from just sort of the, I actually worked in two different WeWorks and I remember uh-huh. that sort of social network function. It seemed weird to me, not even, not, not weird. It just seemed like another, yeah. if you told me in 2017 that that was sort of part of the pitch, I'd be like, that seems, <laughs> it seems fine. You know, it, it's fine that you could use this sort of thing, but could you speak sort of, the, I think the examples you wrote about are, what was it? The auto temp, the temperature levels. Yeah. Within, yeah. <laughs> There, there were kind of all those kinds of things, which were, you know, let's, let, I mean, some of this now feels quaint, but, you know, a, a standing desk that automatically adjusts to your height, a phone booth that adjusts to the temperature you want automatically. All these things are potentially ways in which you could make an office more 
techie, I guess, but, but they weren't ways in, that would actually, weren't things that would actually change the basic economics of the business. They would make the offices maybe a little, a uh, little nicer, but, but wouldn't, wouldn't sort of, um, make, make that much of a difference in the business. What, what Adam kept talking about was that WeWork was going to become, was going to be a physical social network was sort of the talking point that he, he actually landed on pretty early on way back in 2012. He sort of started talking about that. And even before that, he had kind of been talking about it a little bit internally. And, and, you know, the idea was we have all these buildings, um, we're going to connect you to all of the people um, who, are, who are in the other WeWorks. So you're not just running into the, your neighbor at the, at the you know, coffee, um, coffee station uh, in your own WeWork, but you can connect with any of them around the world. And they tried that as it sounds like, you know, you, you saw some version of this. There were many different versions of trying to create that network, but LinkedIn already exists and, and it wasn't sort of, you know, Facebook already exists. These other social networks kind of already existed and it wasn't, it just never became clear what the, the sort of use of this would be. And I think that's at least some kind of lesson is, is that you can't just sort of slap technology onto what you're doing already and expect it to kind of make, make a difference um, and, and, and to suddenly turn you into a tech company. Yeah, my favorite random anecdote from the book was that the Magnesis then Fire Festival, um, Billy McFarland of recent podcast fame actually was sort of in talks to get bought by we were because Magnesis was the company that was sort of trying to build that live sort of in-person community aspects. So that was just that was so random, but it actually does make sense from a narrative perspective at least. Yeah, I mean, you know, B Billy was, uh, he was a tenant for a long time at WeWork well before uh, the fire Festival. And, and when I talked to him uh, in prison, uh, he, he sort of was, was inspired, but claimed to have been kind of inspired by WeWork and the desire to sort of connect people. Obviously, both of these efforts sort of went off the rails a little bit, but, but it does make sense. You know, it, it, it at least makes sense in, in, in the way of like WeWork was trying to find all of these w different ways to, to build community. Um, and, and I think the trouble is, as, as the WeWork story points out is it's difficult to do that. It's difficult to do that in, in, in the real world and, and no one has quite figured it out. Do you think people are, so, and this is, and this is why I sort of titled this section of the script stories matter. So I think if Adam mm. had a key skill set, it was being able to sort of tell stories in that post recession, yeah. you know, software is eating the world world and the community part was huge. Do you think people are searching for community in the way that he was articulating it? I think they were. I, I mean, definitely after the recession, um, you know, you look at a lot of the rhetoric that WeWork was using. It was it was a lot of the rhetoric of of kind of what we now sort of assume that that millennials, especially younger workers, um, were looking for in 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 their offices. And I, you know, we're in a different era now, but I think obviously community is something we're all kind of desperate for and, and figuring out how to get in, in sort of new ways. But, but I do think that Adam kind of tapped into that. And I, and I don't, you know, a lot of people have asked me and, and I was, I talked to a lot of people who, who were close to Adam about this, of, of whether he sort of believed that pitch or, or if it was just kind of a sales pitch. And I, I think he did. I think he genuinely believed that um, people wanted community. They wanted connection and I think he was right about that. And I think where things got tricky is that, as, as a few people pointed out to me, uh, community is a difficult thing to scale. Um, and, and every social network has, has discovered this in, in different ways. And it, the, the challenges are even more so when, when you're talking about a physical, you know, a physical community of, of actual people in an actual space. Yeah. So something that fascinates me is throughout the book, you quote Adam as sort of referring to his ideal end state of WeWork as being a company that's sort of too big to fail, which is sort of another example of how sort of post 2008 financial crisis yeah. rhetoric sort of. So A, that brings up the obvious question of, let's say the WeWork bonanza had sort of gone on into sort of COVID disaster space. Yeah. Um, do you think there ever was a world where that could have been possible? Is too big to fail an idea that even applies to real estate? Because, you know, I think you're in New York, correct? Correct. Yeah. So I think anyone who lives in New York or any big city like San Francisco is thinking about this a lot. 
Yeah, I'm looking at a lot of buildings and all of them are owned by different people. No, no one dominates the, the real estate world. And it's obviously, you know, there's a certain amount of irony in, in the idea of too big to fail becoming something that people aspire to when in fact it was sort of a, a, a moniker of these institutions that had, had failed society really and, and, and not something that, that we wanted, a sort of a necessary evil, I guess. Um, if if you look at the thing at the re, if you look at the real estate world in general, yeah, I think it it's no one uh, aspires to be too big to fail. It's almost impossible. If you look anywhere in in New York City and San Francisco, or really all over the world, um, owning a, a few a few percentage points is is the most anyone um, uh, could hope for, and that's not that's not two, three, four percent. That's 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3% of, of the market is really, those are some of the biggest real estate companies around. So there, there was this, this level at which that idea didn't totally make sense. It was, it was not, it was an ambition that was, was probably too ambitious for its own good. Yeah. So back to the soft bank part where we sort of left off at in the narrative. And this is why we were talking about like, what is a tech company? Because obviously SoftBank is, uh, you know, a, is Japanese. Uh, Masayoshi Stone is investing in tech companies. Can you sort of speak to how that conversation started and why that investment sort of mattered for the company in 20, I think 2016, 2017? They first met, Adam and Masa met in 2016 in India at a, at a startup conference. And it, it wasn't until sort of the end of 2017 that, that the investment actually came through, but it was over sort of the course of a year and a half of, of discussion. And, and yeah, you know, SoftBank is this sort of technology conglomerate. Um, and and the, the big thing that had happened in advance of, of the WeWork investment was the creation of, of the Vision Fund, which was this $100 million venture capital fund, largely backed by the Saudi Arabian government, um, among, among other investors, that had entrusted Masa with, with sort of trying to find companies um, that were building sort of the future. Um, you know, he had talked about it kind of in the way that, that Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's uh, firm sort of had, had collected kind of companies in various industries that had defined the, the economy of the last century. He wanted to look forward. And, and in large part, that meant artificial intelligence. And that was Moss's great sort of thing that he zeroed in on. The other thing that, that Masa loved was is he, he loved entrepreneurs and he loved ambition. And, and he, you know, very famously uh, made a bet early on on, on Jack Ma and um, Alibaba that, that turned into one of the best venture capital investments of, of all time. And, and the way Masa has always talked about it is that he invested as much in, in Jack Ma as he did in, in the business. And, and that seems to have been the case with, with WeWork where he connected, he saw all the reasons that there, there was reason to question what WeWork was, was selling, um, that it was something more than a real estate company, but, but he seems to have bought into Adam's ability to sort of push that vision and push the company towards that. Yeah. So the sort of famous anecdote that comes out of, Masa's interactions with Adam was his whole, I think, and correct me if the quote is wrong, who wins in a fight, a crazy man or a smart man, Adam picks crazy man. I'm curious what you sort of think as someone who was involved in that story of like looking at that sort of quote five years later, it's unclear what the answer is. Um, from sort of Masa's perspective, because I think the problem here is that from a venture capital perspective, the crazy man, if that's one out of 100, that seems to make sense. But I'm just, how, how, how do you think about that quote five years later? Yeah, it's a tricky one because I, I, I don't know if he's wrong. Uh, yeah, that's the... <laughs> uh, I, if, I, I think in, in many ways, that's, that, that probably is, is the reality. Um, on, on the other hand, you'd like to think that smarts and tactics and, and strategy can can win the day. Um, and, and, you know, as with all of these kind of dichotomies, the answer is probably in the middle. Like you, you want to have a plan, <laughs> you want to be smart. And then if you want to build one of these giant behemoths, you're going to at some point have to do something that traditional business sense MBA school education would tell you to do otherwise. And, and that is kind of I think that's maybe some of the the lesson here is, and and it's you know all of this gets simplified where there were plenty of people and we were working on plans and models 
and and all of these things and and I think the issue was that that at a certain point more often than not those were thrown out the window and and the ambition was just yeah this this may not totally make sense but we got the money to do it we're going to we're going to give it a shot and and the impulse the, the right impulse may be to to stick with your plan more often than not and to to be crazy when when the moment feels right yeah so before we move out of sort of this space i i made reference to the whole software is eating the world idea cuz that's sort of another one of these stories that matters so mark yeah. andreessen of A16Z, co-founder of Netscape, has this essay that he sort of puts in the Wall Street Journal that basically are, and obviously he did not create the sort of boom of these companies in of himself, but I think he summed up the idea that defined the tech and VC space in the 2010s, which is that just as Netflix took over Blockbuster, just as Uber beat the taxi unions and the regulators, you're going to see anything that's involved in software and tech just tr radically transform industries. And that, when you apply that framework to the venture capital idea, that suggests you should be taking your billions and putting it into search for those home runs in the space. So as we're closing out, well, they've been, the 2010s have been closed out. Can you just sort of look back at that narrative and sort of just think about how it sort of applied, especially given that a lot of companies in those industries haven't actually turned the profits or had the successful IPOs or even the exits that that narrative would suggest? Yeah, I think, uh, and you know, as I think about this question, I, I, there was an interesting article um, last year in, in the Atlantic by Derek Thompson that was sort of about how uh, about the fact that that if you look at all these tech companies and their effect on sort of the physical environment that that we live in, the effect isn't that much, um, you know. And in a lot of ways, the tech world has has chosen to kind of you know, focus on, on information knowledge based, uh, kind of endeavors as opposed to remaking the, the physical world. And, and we work for better or worse was an effort to kind of try, try to do that. And I think it, the lesson of, of some of these companies is that it's actually really hard to do this and, and, and that, you know, disruption, uh, is is not as as easy as it seems when you're when you're dealing with with the physical world with with real people as opposed to just sort of real people interacting in in the digital space. Yeah, and then to bring it sort of back to Mark Andreessen for a second, he did another essay in May called "It's Time to Build," yep. talking about it's not a repudiation of software is eating the world, but it basically just sort of it's like a I'd say it's an addendum that COVID and sort of the various post-2016 issues have related the need to sort of build in the physical space as well too. Are you confident in this model of investments, of, of the tech industry and this model of investments ability to build sort of in the world of, you know, atoms, not just in bits? Mm -hmm. I'm a little skeptical because, and and in some ways, you know, the venture capital world may not want to be involved there. You know, they, they, you you don't want to fund these businesses that are incredibly labor intensive and capital intensive. That's sort of the, you know, the 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 opposite of of what many of these venture capital firms are are pushing companies toward and. And so, you know, it's possible that for a lot of these problems, the, the VC world is not the place that's, that's going to solve them, that it's going to take, um, you know, bigger institutions. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I remember that essay by Mark Andreessen, and I, I remember reading it and kind of thinking, you know, he, he objected in many ways to, to the notion that the government should be responsible for a lot of these things. But I, I think the reality is with, with all of these industries, um, the, you you need a big institution to to be driving any kind of real change and that and that disrupting these things is is actually very difficult and that venture funded startups may not be the best way to do it so i do think it's a time to build i think that new kind of empires and and new ways of doing things are going to be built um and sort of i think the question is what the the vc world has has learned from kind of the the past decade of, of doing things this way. Yeah. So speaking of the decade, the part that works from a narrative perspective is how tidy this, and obviously recessions are terrible, but WeWork starts 
post-recession. We're in this weird COVID recession where no one is going to the office at all. How do you think about, and I'm guessing, I think you're recording from home as am I right now. Yep. Um, how do you think about, to, so two questions here. Question one is, what narratives do you think are going to come out of this COVID recession space? And then two, how do you think work is going to change? I, I personally am not in the category of person who thinks that we're all going to enjoy working from home. I've been doing this for six months. It's awful. Um, I can't wait to, I used to go to New York a lot. I'm in DC right now. I can't wait to get back. I don't think cities are over, but how do you think about those two things, the narratives and sort of the future of work discussion? Yeah. I mean, you know, the narrative is hard to figure out, I think, especially because it feels like we're in the middle of it. It doesn't feel like we're coming out of it yet. Um, and, and I think, you know, the narrative will be um, that, you know, I, I think everything we do going forward is, is going to be with being prepared for this happening again, I think is, is something that, that we're all going to have to deal with. And then with, with office space, I mean, yeah, the sort of irony of the WeWork story is that what the company offered is, is kind of what we all sort of desperately want right now. Like I would love to be in an office space where I could, you know, go, go meet people, um, uh, you know, every single day, just, just buy the coffee. And, and so, um, you know, what, what will the future look like? I don't think we're all going to be working from home. I think there's a, a strong possibility that, that sort of the model that we work had instituted at Institute of these these kind of flexible spaces. You know, you might need you might not need a big headquarters. You might need a, just a couple of small offices um, here and there. Uh, I think finding sort of unique ways to use space is going to be important. Which, in some ways, if 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 we were can sort of weather the storm, puts them in a in a reasonable position to to kind of try to figure this out. On the other hand, all of the other commercial real estate giants in the world are, are trying to answer the same questions and, and, you know, in some ways maybe as, as equally suited to, to figuring it out. So it's going to be kind of a, a race to, to sort of both figure out what people want um, out of their offices. Cause you know, I, I don't know that we're going to go back to exactly what was normal, but you know, will a company really be able, you know, there's all these tech companies that are saying, you know, wrote remote work for good. I, I, I don't know if, if that's going to happen and, and the in whatever the sort of in between is, I think is going to be what most companies gravitate towards. Yeah. So to tee up a narrative for you then that I see emerging from certain sure. parts of VC Twitter uh, would be the sort of decentralization case that what's going to happen after this, and this is really coming from a lot of people who are in the sort of cryptocurrency Bitcoin community, that centralization is a set, not, I don't want to sort of parody of you, but basically what I would say in good faith is that decentralization is going to be the story of the 2020s, away from sort of big companies that have these big fancy headquarters, away from sort of big cities with hour and a half commutes. It's going to be much more about companies that could get even further online so they have a remote distributed workforce. That's sort of, and so what do you think about that? And, and I personally, I, 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 I like what you're saying about that there's an that we shouldn't have a binary choice here, but there's an in-between. What I would say is I would lean more towards centralization in the sense that a company that does say, look, obviously we're flexible four or five days a week, we could like work something out, but we are located in Austin, we are located in DC, we are located right. in New York. That is going to be a company that goes way too far into the remote idea where they're sort of like, we've got Indians and Nigerians, then there's this dude in Alaska and it's so great because we can do this sort of techno libertarian thing. But I'm just sort of skeptical of that model. Yeah, I think anytime these kind of these real sort of societal disruptions happen, I think there's a skepticism of of large institutions in some way. I think you you look at the financial crisis, like the places where people wanted to go work, the the Lehman Brothers, the Bear Stearnses of the world, where were people were suddenly very skeptical of them. You know, small business was sort of the the thing that that people wanted for for a variety of reasons. And then look, by the end of the decade, we're, we're talking about these giant companies with, with the tens of thousands of employees that, that had grown out of nothing. And so I think there will be a, a cycle uh, that, that may emerge where there may be some decentralization uh, in, in all the kinds of ways that you talk about. But, I, but ultimately, I, I think, you know, the, the corollary to that is, is um, you know, people want to be in cities, people want to work at, at these big companies in a, in a lot of ways. And so, 
you know, I, I could see some change for a while, but I would suspect that it will, in, just in the way that these cycles sort of work, that it will trend back towards where it was. Yeah. So for our last section, I'm going to do a very inelegant pivot to your reporting on Vice, your okay. journalist. Um, and the reason why I think these things are tied together, and I'm curious if this was sort of in your head as you're doing the reporting on both these stories is that in many ways, the story of Vice, Vice News, media company from founded in Canada, headquartered in New York, um, gave us Shane Smith, Gavin McGinnis, a very, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff like that's a whole other episode to a certain degree. But but I, I am just sort of curious at a structural level within the level we're having this conversation, sort of the ideas of taking a lot of venture capital, um, the idea that industries that are typically sort of outside of tech, aka journalism in this case, when they're when you sort of add sort of the inner, they could have that sort of big return too. How, how can you just sort of talk about like a tie between the story of Vice and WeWork? Yeah, I mean, I I thought about these companies very clearly as as sort of corollaries to each other, and I'd throw Uber in there as well, which I wrote about in in 2017 for New York Magazine, and and I think there were two sort of themes I I saw in in the ways these these companies sort of um kind of I think get away from themselves, and and the the main one um I mean I mean one is just growing fast is hard, and I think a lot of the problems that emerge in these companies just come from that fact, whether they're sort of business model problems or internal HR issues. A lot of it just comes from when you're suddenly adding dozens and then hundreds and eventually in WeWork's case, thousands of employees a year. Um, it's hard to keep up with that. And then I, I think the thing that all these uh, companies sort of tried to do um, was they, they weren't and this this goes for you know so many companies that I can think of over, over the past decade of of not being sort of content to just do what you're good at and and be what you are. I mean, Vice made these great sort of punky kind of news documentaries. Uh, they were extremely popular um, and they were really good at it. And uh, but but that wasn't enough for for what Shane Smith um, and others wanted. You know, he talked about as as I think you said, being the new CNN, uh, being the new ESPN. He kind of wanted to just be the new giant media company um, for young people. And, and it wasn't, it was never sort of clear that, that Vice was going to become that. And, and you could sort of argue that, um, you know, shooting, shooting for the stars is, is, is a good enough uh, goal to have. But I, I think a lot of the ways in which these companies sort of go off the rails is tied to how they try to pursue different businesses that they aren't necessarily expert in. And, and to tie it back to WeWork, it, it, it goes for the company getting into apartments and opening a gym and eventually opening an elementary school, all of which were connected by the fact that, you know, you needed a space to, to put those things in, but otherwise are, are basically entirely different businesses. So sort of the earlier part of the conversation, we were basically discussing whether or not real estate was a venture return industry. Mm -hmm. Do you think, and this is where the debate around vice matters, and this also applies to a variety of other companies, Mike, Mashable, um, Upworthy that took on venture capital. Do you think journal, and, and you, you obviously, you know, you're, you're with New York Magazine, which is owned by Vox Media, which has taken on venture capital as well. Do you think broadly speaking, however, journalism is an industry where the venture capital return idea applies. Yeah, well, I, I, I hate to be a company man, but I, I think if you look at kind of the companies that, that have, have emerged from the VC model in the journalism space, there, there aren't a ton of, of real kind of long-term success stories. And I, I think one reason Vox has, has been pretty good at, at, at doing that, at least, you know, compared to some of our competitors, is, is a sense of, growing responsibly um, and and making smart bets rather than trying to you know claim you know we're going to be the the replace the New York Times or, or whatever it might be so you know I, in in theory any industry is is open to that I mean you know one of one of the problems is uh, I, I think in in these businesses and this is this is one there's one problem I think the the venture world runs up against is there's always an impulse of like you know, let's solve this with technology. And and journalism is not something you can solve with technology. Technology can help, but ultimately there there need to be people there to to make these judgment calls, to do the reporting, to do the writing. And you know, ultimately they're kind of labor intensive businesses. So they're they're never gonna totally return the 
you know, 20 X kind of multiples that, that other places are getting. But, you know, I, I think if you handle it kind of responsibly and, and, and sensibly, and that's the approach you take, then, then there, there is some promise in these industries. Great. Well, that's a, that's an optimistic tone, which is good to have after the first trying to have, <laughs> trying to may, hold, hold on to any kind of optimism I can. Definitely. So Reeves, thank you so much. Where can everyone find you? Uh, you can uh, search my name and you'll find me on, on Twitter and, and various other uh, places. And, and, and the book is, is, of course, available wherever you like to buy books. So, Great. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me.